Well, it's Rotor Talk. My name is Tom Anderson. Back, back, Tom, 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 Tom Anderson. Back, play to back, 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 that terrific talk podcast. Here comes the host. I'm your host, Tom Anderson. First, behind the back. It gets to Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. Back, 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 Welcome to Terrific Talk. I'm Tom Anderson. We've got a really great podcast for you today. I'm so excited to introduce my next guest. I'm a big fan of his, Matt Weiner. Now, Matt does it all. You've seen him covering the Major League Baseball playoffs on TBS. Of course, you see him all over NBA TV. You've seen him covering college basketball on CBS. Many of you listening probably got to know Matt during his eight years at ESPN, where he worked on shows like SportsCenter and NBA Fast Break. He's really one of the very best in the business. I'm so happy he was able to join me today on the podcast. Very nice of him to come by. Matt, welcome to Terrific Talk. I I really came by just for the intro. That was very flattering. (laughs) Well, I really appreciate you coming on. I've been a big fan over the years. Um, I figured we could start at the beginning. Now, watching you and reading you over the years, it's clear to see you love the game of basketball. But you're from the St. Louis area. St. Louis, obviously a great baseball town. I don't know, you might have been a little too young to be a big Spirits fan. I was just wondering if you grew up a bigger fan of baseball than basketball as a kid. Strangely, I gravitated toward basketball. Uh, and you're right, St. Louis is first and foremost a, a baseball town. Um, and the, the St. Louis Hawks had left three or four years before I was born, so I had no affiliation with them, didn't really know about them until later. Mm. And you're right, I have a vague memory of the Spirits of St. Louis, but uh, that team folded when I was probably seven. Yeah. So, so you're right. I, I remember them being on TV. I remember them being a basketball team, but I, I never went to see them or anything like that. Um, the reason I first gravitated toward basketball was really Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. For some reason, I was fascinated by him, huh. um, and so I began following him. I, I read a couple of books about him, um, and I think part of it was, and this maybe says more about my nature than the game itself, but there was a certain novelty to the NBA because it was not played in St. Louis and it wasn't really all that accessible back then in the pre-internet, pre-national right. uh, TV live game deals sort of era. Uh, back then, the, the, a lot of the playoff games were on tape delay. Uh, you couldn't turn on NBA TV or the TNT or ESPN because they didn't exist, mm-hmm. um, and watch games every single night of the week. And so it, it was it was sort of an exotic thing to me as a kid. And I, it also happened to be the case that basketball was the game I enjoyed playing the most and probably the game I was best at gotcha. as a kid, which is frankly not saying much. But um, <laughs> uh, So anyway, for whatever reason, I did gravitate toward it. I was a huge Cardinals fan as well, Yeah, uh, football Cardinals fan when I was a kid. Uh, hmm. Less of a hockey fan, but uh, for whatever reason, I was I was sort of an anomaly in St. Louis as a kid who really liked uh, the NBA basketball in general, but but really the NBA. Now you obviously grew up a big sports fan. When did you realize you wanted to work in sports broadcasting? Pretty early on. I'm, I'm pretty lucky in that regard. I uh, I knew I wanted to do something along the lines of broadcasting when I was probably seven or eight years old. Wow. Um, and you know, the sports broadcasting in particular appealed to me as a kid who liked sports, but um, there were times along the way when I thought that could be uh, also news reporting or, or something else. Mm-hmm. But you know, I was lucky enough to grow up, you've got to understand, in that era, I grew up with Jack Buck doing St. Louis Cardinals baseball. Right. Bob Costas was doing Missouri Tiger basketball when I was a kid, and I used to listen to him doing radio mm-hmm. in, um, in St. Louis. Uh, we had people like Gary Bender doing local TV there. Uh, Dan Deerdorf was a uh, local TV sportscaster after his football career ended in St. Louis. And I had all these these sort of great influences, whether I knew they were influences or not, um, to emulate and, and learn from. Even if, even if I wasn't doing it consciously, I was I was listening to these guys. Right. Uh, but it was something I knew pretty early on. So you worked at a 
did, I believe, four different TV stations all across the country before you ended up at ESPN. Can you just talk a little yeah. bit about the experiences you gained during that time and how it helped you prepare for the bigger stage? Great experiences. Uh, you're right. I worked in my first TV job out of college was Billings, Montana. Hmm. I was in Jackson, Mississippi. I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, I was then I was back in St. Louis, my hometown, which was uh, a great experience unto itself. But yeah. to answer your question, I think it's important for for any young broadcaster to figure out who he or she is along the way. And I think there's really no better way to do that than in front of a small audience with very little pressure. You know, I would have jumped at the chance to work somewhere like St. Louis, for instance, right, right. out of college, because that's where I was from, and it was a bigger market. But I really do think it was invaluable to broadcast in a place like Billings where there where the number of cattle outnumber people by, you know, uh, 100 to 1, probably. <laughs> um, you, can, you can figure out who you are, really, and you can make mistakes along the way, and that's just as important as any other lesson, is figuring out what works for you, what doesn't work for you, what's, what's true to yourself, uh, what feels like you're, you know, uh, trying to be somebody else. Because ultimately, the people I like most on the air, the, the people I've always admired and then later met, are, are closer to versions of their real personalities than yeah. people who are putting on some sort of an act. So really, that, that's the big lesson along the way, is to figure out what you do well and who you are as a, as a broadcaster and what your style is. Now, I'm curious, um, how did the whole interview process work for getting into ESPN? Did someone discover you there? How did it all come about? You know, I wish I had a great story for this, uh, and I really don't. It's it's a pretty simple thing. I I had uh, I hired an agent in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, in fact, that's a more interesting story. The <laughs> guy who hired me there was a fellow Missouri alum. Uh-huh. Um, he hired me, and about a week after I started, he was fired for whatever reason. Oh, jeez. And that happens. I mean, it's TV, and, and that sort of thing happens from time to time. Mm-hmm. But he decided he didn't want to leave town. His wife had a good job there. They liked living there. And so he was one of these guys who had been to every RTNDA convention for the last 25 years or something. And so he had a lot of contacts with the business. Mm -hmm. He decided to become an agent, and uh, I was one of his, his first clients. So he helped facilitate the move from Grand Rapids to St. Louis. And then wow. after three years there, and my contract was coming up, and we were trying to decide what to do and, and what the possibilities were, he basically sent a tape to ESPN, to Al Jaffe and that group there, uh, and they called and brought me in for an interview, and I did an audition, and you know, obviously it worked out well enough that they brought me in to, to work. So there's really not a, there's really not a, a, one of those great TV stories where some, somebody happened to see me and, uh, and, and sought me out or anything like that. It was a pretty standard process of we apply, we interview, and, and they decide to make an offer. What would you say is the biggest difference between working at ESPN and working now at Turner Sports? Scale. Yeah. That, that's the biggest thing by far. I mean, ESPN, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a derogatory way, but ESPN is in a lot of ways a big sports TV factory. They churn out so much product over their, their various entities over the course of a day, it's, it's sort of hard to fathom um, between the internet sites and the various TV networks and all the other avenues they've chosen to pursue via the print, um, you know, they're everywhere, documentaries now, right. all this other stuff. And so it, it is easy to get caught up in the machinery there a little bit, whereas Turner Sports, by comparison, is a boutique shop. It's a much more intimate setting. You're going to get to know the people with whom you work. Um, more closely on a regular basis because you're going to work with the same people all the time. Mm. There were times at ESPN when when I got out of my, toward the, the last few years I was there, I was doing a lot of NBA stuff. Right. So when the NBA season ended and I went back into what I used to call gen pop uh, oh. for the summer and I'm doing fill-in shows on wherever and doing a lot of sports centers and whatnot, mm-hmm. there would be times that occasionally when I'd pop in on a show that was unusual for me and I'd see people I just didn't know directors and PAs and APs and after a while you start to stop asking <laughs> like who they are because you may not see them again for a while wow. there are just so many people there right. and, um, and it's you know it's by necessity because they've, they've grown this gigantic empire over the years 
So I was checking you out last night on NBA TV. You were hosting NBA Game Time. I was just wondering if you could take us through kind of what a typical day is like for you in preparing for that show. Yeah, so we have long nights on NBA TV, right. which is why they don't make me work a ton of them during a week. So the day, first of all, it's not just a, that day. I, I'm, right. I'm reading, I, before we spoke, I was just reading NBA stuff just to keep up on what's going on around the league. Um, during the day, I will prepare a note card uh, for the particular game we're carrying that day. So all sorts of notes and statistics and things. I have a, kind of a card file I use that I keep updated. Okay. Um, so I will spend time doing that on the computer, reading stories about teams, updating statistical information, checking on injuries, that sort of thing, to identify storylines we might address in our pregame show and during halftime and things to watch during the game. In addition to that, I will do a, sort of a smaller version for each other game of the night. So when we do a live look-in on the Bulls Cavaliers last night, that I have some information handy that I, I that I know is there. Right. Obviously, you're going you know, to react to whatever is happening in the game, but you want to have context, and that's ultimately that's really my job as a host is to provide context for what is going on because anybody can point to the the video on the screen and say we have the Cavaliers and Bulls. Right. It's my job to to give the viewer a little more than that and explain why the game is significant, um, react to whatever may be happening in the game in an appropriate way with, with context for the players and, and the kinds of seasons they're having, long-term trends, all that sort of stuff. So a lot of it is just reminder, frankly, and a lot of it is, is to have information there that I know is there in case I need it, and that'll come up occasionally something will happen during the game and I'll be reminded that I have something on this card in front of me that is noteworthy and, and I can go to that. So I spent a lot of time doing that before we ever get in. We typically have a production meeting roughly at 5 o'clock most nights because we're typically on the air at 7 Eastern time. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there it's just a matter of what time the game is because the, the formal pre-game part of the night begins uh, a half hour, really closer to 40 minutes before that game time. And the rest of the night it depends on what we've decided to do that night. We'll, we'll have different segments on different topics or schedule interviews, um, whatever the case may be, and that, that part sort of changes from night to night. Now, real quick, I just want to get your thoughts on the NBA season so far. Who do you think the most fun team to watch is right now? Well, I think there's universal agreement that the uh, Golden State Warriors are, are the most fun yeah. agreement, uh, fun team, I should say, in the NBA. I, it's hard to argue with that. Um, they, they play a fun style. Steph Curry, in particular, is an incredible talent, and I'll just, I, I keep going back to the word fun, but it's fun to watch, because you just don't see people who can do what he does. Uh, and on top of that, I think Mark Jackson has created an atmosphere yeah. where it, it appears as though they enjoy playing together, and, and that makes for a fun environment as well. So I, I would say they're certainly near the top of that list. Um, and early on in the season, some of the teams who are playing unexpectedly well are, are fun to watch for different reasons. The 76ers, who everyone assumed yeah. uh, are tanking 